so I, I have to apologize in, in uh, in advance, I am. I feel like I'm losing my voice after a, after a few days at Rhodes House. So if you can't hear me, um, then please let me know. But um, I am thrilled to welcome all of you to the panel this morning on the future of medicine. And I'm honored and especially humbled to be speaking with Professor Sir John Bell, um, who I'll be speaking shortly. My name is Lena Wen. I'm an emergency physician at George Washington University in DC. And um, I'm also the director of patient-centered care there. And um, today I want to start off with um, with a few comments on what we think are the future medicine and whenever you hear the topic the future medicine I'm sure many things come to your mind whether it's cures for things like cancer and AIDS and malaria or newer tests better MRIs robotic surgeries maybe if you're American you're thinking the Accountable Care Act or maybe not um, or um, we also hear a lot about connected health these days, maybe replacing the act of physically seeing your doctor with an iPhone application or hooking you up to all kinds of leads and other things and sending that to, um, to your doctor to be seen instead. What I want to do this morning is to give you an alternative view. And um, perhaps this will make some of you angry. Perhaps it'll make many of you angry and you'll disagree with my points and I intend that to be the case because I want this to be the beginning of a conversation. And so um, after I speak for 15 minutes or so, um, Sir, uh, Sir John is going to be speaking also about his view and then we'll have a few minutes for questions or many minutes for, for, uh, for, for, for questions and your comments. So as an emergency physician, my greatest privilege is being able to hear the stories of my patients. And so I like to start this morning with, um, with three stories. And I ask that you keep these stories in mind as we go along. And I'll explain their significance um, along the way as well. So the first story is of a gentleman named Jerry, who is a car mechanic based in South Boston. He's in his mid-40s and relatively healthy. I mean, he's a guy who doesn't usually go see his doctor, so as far as he knows, he's pretty healthy. He goes to the doctor this time because of a discomfort in his chest. But it's not really a chest discomfort because what happened was that he was moving boxes over the weekend, lifting heavy boxes, and when he woke up in the morning, he started having some discomfort in his chest, a soreness in his chest, but also soreness in his back and a soreness in his legs and in his arms. Now, many people will say, well, that's a muscle strain, musculoskeletal pain. But Jerry isn't sure. He talks to his wife, and his, doctor, and his wife said, anytime you have pain between your belly and your neck, you have to be worried about this being chest pain. And so Jerry calls his doctor. He gets referred to the local ER because his doctor said, well, chest pain, you've got to get this checked out. And so Jerry goes to the ER, and he's immediately hooked up to machines. He gets an EKG done. He gets a chest x-ray done. He gets lab work done. He gets told that he has to stay overnight. And so, of course, Jerry says, well, I got to stay the night. So Jerry stays the night. He gets more blood drawn, more EKGs done. He runs on a treadmill. And at the end of all of that, the doctor tells him, congratulations. You don't have pneumonia. You don't have rib fractures. You don't have collapsed lung. You don't have a heart attack. You have chest pain. <laughs> So Jerry says, but I don't understand. I mean, I came to you saying I have chest pain. Why am I going home with the same symptom that I'm coming in with? But Jerry doesn't really know what to do at this point. And so he um, uh, goes back to his doctor in a few weeks for a checkup. And he tells his doctor that in the interim, he's had several more episodes of this chest pain. And his doctor says, well, I've got to refer you to see some specialists. And so he goes to see a cardiologist who gives him a catheterization. He goes to see a GI doctor who does an endoscopy and looks at, at, at his stomach and his uh, esophagus. And the great news is that his heart vessels and his stomach all look fantastic. However, the test did reveal in the process, he also gets some CAT scans. He, they did reveal that he has a lung nodule. Then he had a more extensive MRI scan that found that he has a thyroid nodule, which led him to get biopsies of all of these things. And in the process, he had a wound infection, a bout of pneumonia, and a blood clot in his legs. So now Jerry will tell you today that he feels lucky because he's fine and he's doing well and these tests were negative. But is he really, did he get great medical care or was he a victim of overtreatment? You know, we talk about cost of care all the time, right? No country is immune from the issue of how to rein in escalating cost. In the US, we certainly think about it a lot. We have, we spend $2.7 trillion on healthcare, approaching 20% of our GDP. Now, where I live, it's taboo to talk about rationing as a way to reduce cost. But what about rational health care? 
I mean, is it rational to do unnecessary testing? Is it rational, for example, for us to spend 30% of our healthcare costs on things that are actually waste? In the US, 750 billion is estimated to be spent on unnecessary testing and unnecessary treatment. And it's not just about cost, but also about risk as well. Every single test has risk. I mean, if you're going to have surgery, or if you're going to take a medication, if you're going to get a treatment of some type, you know that there's risk involved. But testing also has risks too. Let me just cite a couple of things. A study in the British Journal of Radiology found that for a 40-year-old woman to get one single CT scan of her chest, that increases her lifetime risk of cancer by one in 200. Another study in the Archives of Internal Medicine reported that there were 29,000 cancers that happened as a result of CT scans done in one year. I'm not talking about, um, about cancers that are found because of the CT. I'm talking about cancers that are caused by the CT scanning alone. But of course, we never hear about these harms. The stories that we hear in the news are about how life-saving these tests are and how wonderful it is to get these tests. But what about the harms of testing? What about the harms of overtreatment? And we know that there's even greater incentive when it comes to treatment as well. Take back pain, which, nearly, which affects nearly everyone over the course of our lifetimes. A study in JAMA found that the number of complex back surgeries increased 15-fold in the last five years. But no new data came out. And it's just a very, very expensive procedure or mental illness. Our definition of disease has morphed such that if you're grieving for two weeks after the death of your child, then you have depression. If you have a child who is inquisitive and eager, then that child has attention deficit disorder. Prescription drug overdoses kill more people in the U.S. than traffic fatalities. All at the same time, the medical costs are bankrupting us, and many people are priced out of basic life-saving treatments. So I contend that we're facing an epidemic of overtreatment, and unless we do, do something about that, then that too is the future of medicine. Story number two is of a woman named Danielle. Maybe this will resonate with some of the younger people here. So she's a college student, also based in Boston, which is where I trained, and um, she came into the hospital because of a headache. But what happened was that she went drinking with her friends the night before. She had some shots and some beer and some wine and wakes up in the morning with this pounding, splitting headache. She also has a dry mouth, hoarse voice. She feels lightheaded. Now, I'm sure all of you can recall back to your Oxford days and know that this is a hangover, right? I mean, maybe some of you feel like that this morning. I don't know, after yesterday. But, um, you know, but she comes, she just feels terrible. But she has a hangover. She doesn't know, though, exactly what this is. She calls her mom, who gets worried. The student health center is closed, and so she goes to the local ER for some treatment. But the doctor that sees her hears that she has the worst headache of her life, which by definition, all of us at some point in our lives are going to have the worst headache of our lives. But still, the doctor hears that and says, well, we need to do a CAT scan of your head and we have to do a spinal tap to make sure that you don't have bleeding in your brain, to make sure that you don't have meningitis. Now Danielle is terrified, right? Because she just went in because she has a hangover. And now she's told that she either signs out against medical advice or she may die. I mean, she gets, you know, she gets all these papers to sign. She although she's terrified. So you know what she does? She goes to the bathroom. She takes off her hospital gown, rips off all the leads that are attached to her, takes out her own IV, and so there's this pool of blood on the ground. And she opens the window, and she jumps out the window. Now, it's a first floor window, or ground floor window, um, and, um, and she's fine. And one could argue that she even did the smart thing because she avoided these <laughs> unnecessary testing and the side effects you know, that come from that. But this is not ideal medical care, right? We should not be forcing our patients out the window and making them feel so trapped that the only way out is to jump out the window. And I can show this example to illustrate that doctors these days are practicing cookbook medicine, running through a checklist of yes-no questions rather than personalizing care to the individual. A lot of offices, a lot of ERs have algorithms that they follow. If you have chest pain, you get these tests. If you have headache, you get these treatments. Now, I'm sure you can think of many reasons for this growing trend. Time, for example. So I work in the emergency room, and on an average eight-hour shift, I see somewhere between 40 and 60 patients. That's a lot of people in, in eight hours. But also, we know that doctors interrupt patients. I, I want you guys to guess, what is the average length of time you have to speak before the doctor interrupts you? So you go into the doctor, and the doctor says, what brings you to see us today, Mr. Smith? When does the doctor interrupt you? 20, 30 seconds. 20, 30 seconds. Any other guesses? 
seven seconds. Wow, pessimist there. But you know what? You're actually right. The um, statistics are something like eight to ten seconds. Eight to ten seconds. So how much of your history can you convey in eight to ten seconds? And yet we know, we know, based on studies done in the 50s, 60s, 70s, all the way to present day, that 80 percent of diagnoses, 80 percent of diagnoses can be made just based on your history alone. Yet when's the last time you heard about us trying to figure out investing millions or billions into developing a better history? We spend billions developing better tests. And so, you know, also when I talk to American doctors, and I'm sure there are some American doctors in this audience, they'll also immediately cite malpractice as a concern. And I don't doubt that defensive medicine plays a role, especially for us practicing in the U.S. And yet we know that the number one cause of malpractice is miscommunication, and not listening isn't exactly helping with that. What fear of malpractice has done, though, is to breed mutual distrust, such that patients don't trust their doctors to do right by them. And doctors fear that their patients might sue them. And so I'd call the second epidemic an epidemic of fear. Final third story is of a woman named Sandy. So she's an elementary school teacher based on Los Angeles. She's in her early 40s. And she goes to see her doctor because she's having some vague symptoms. She's feeling run down. She feels tired. She has a cough that wouldn't go away. Now, this has been going on for a couple months, and so she's pretty sure that something is going on. But her doctor sees this relatively healthy 40-something woman and says, oh, don't worry, you have a virus. You must have caught it from the kids. She's had viruses before, so she doesn't think that that's what's going on. But since the doctor tells her she's okay, she's happy with that. So she goes back to the doctor in a few weeks because the symptoms don't go away. They're only getting worse. And this time, the doctor says, all right, we'll run some tests. Now, we don't know exactly what tests were run because he didn't tell her he drew some blood. So I'm assuming that he tested her for anemia or thyroid. Maybe he looked at a chest x-ray to look for pneumonia. At the end of all of that, he says to her, all these tests are negative, so you're fine. Go home. Now, she still doesn't know what's going on. And soon, the doctor's giving her antidepressants because maybe she's depressed. She goes to seek a second opinion from the partner of this doctor, who then says, well, maybe you're anxious. I mean, you've been to see the doctor you know, five or six times. What's going on? So she gets some Valium. It's not until about a year later that she's finally diagnosed with breast cancer that at that point is widely metastatic, metastatic to her brains, to her lungs, and to her liver. Now, for all the talk that we give about a cost and unhappiness, there's an even bigger problem for those who face it, which is medical error. In the U.S., 250 million people, not 250 million, about 250,000 people, or a quarter of a million people, die because of medical error. And we know that the number one cause of medical error is misdiagnosis. Now, when I present the scenario of Sandy, the school teacher, to medical students, many of them will raise their hands and say, well, I know what the problem is. This is the counter-narrative of Jerry, right, the guy with the chest pain. Because they'll say, well, Jerry had all these tests and that was good. This is why we need all these tests, because, because of someone like Sandy, she should have gotten more tests. Well, you know what, if she got every single test that Jerry got, her diagnosis still wouldn't have been made. The issue, I would contend, is not that she didn't have enough tests, but rather that she didn't get the right tests that the doctor never listened to her. I mean, what was the implication when these tests were negative? That she was somehow crazy? I mean, we have to think about that, right? Of what happens when we do order these tests. Now, there's so many so-called solutions to make medical care safer and better. More advanced imaging, more sensitive tests. I mean, if only we had a test, a blood test looking for breast cancer, right? Or how about replacing the visit to the doctor with iPhone applications that track your blood pressure, your EKG, and everything else? Well, all of this leads to more care and more costly care, but not necessarily better care. And paradoxically, in the attempt to make us more connected, they're leading us further in this epidemic, this third epidemic of disconnection. So how do we solve these issues now of overtreatment and fear and disconnection? Or can we even solve it? I mean, one of my greatest pet peeves, actually, is um, talking to health professionals in particular, and especially maybe US health uh, professionals who are always quick to blame, right? And, and people will say, oh, well, you know, we can't solve the problem. It's the system that's at fault. It's big pharma, insurance companies. Um, there's nothing that we individually can do. Or when I talk to patients, the same thing. There's nothing that I, as the individual the patient, can do. But then, who is the system, right? If it's not each of us as patients, if it's not each of us as caregivers, with each of us as interest in health, as citizens, then who is it? And remember, too, that we all, as patients, are to blame as well. We, the patients, we, the public, we were the ones who were complicit 
in buying into science at the expense of the art of medicine. We idolize the new, we demand tests, and we glamorize new technologies. We often adopt new things wholesale without asking for evidence for why it's so great, like robotic surgeries. There's no evidence saying that robots performing surgeries is better than the trained surgeon. And in fact, evidence is coming out showing exactly the opposite. But so many hospitals in the US at least are advertising this, and people are going into hospitals saying, I want this latest technology. And so just as we were all part of the problem, we all have to be part of the solution as well. Tip O'Neill said that all politics is local, and I believe in the corollary that all medicine is personal. And so change has to start with all of us and our next interaction with our doctors. And so I'll give you just three quick things to think about. The first is the next time you see your doctor, think about your story and not about your symptoms. So we all tend to go to the doctor and we want our doctors to ask us questions, right? So we say, I have a headache. And the doctor will say, well, when did your headache start? What, um, what other symptoms are associated with that? What is it on a scale of one to time? And you'll get all these yes or no questions. But is that actually better than telling your story? Well, think about being here at the Rhodes reunion. You haven't seen an old friend for a while, right? And so you ask, well, what do you say to your old friend that you haven't seen in 30, 40 years? You say to your friend, how have you been? How are you? You don't say, are you married? Are you divorced? Are you employed? Did you finish law school? I mean, you'll get, you'll get some kind of answers to these questions, but then that person's going to walk away from you probably. And also, you won't get nearly the depth or the nuance as you would have if you just asked for their story to begin with. So think of your story and not, not your symptoms. The second, think of yourself as a patient and not as a consumer. So recently I attended a conference with, um, of patient advocates that's now been rebranded as the healthcare consumer advocates. And that conference was very confusing, I have to tell you, because everybody was trying to change their vocabulary of doctor patient to doctor healthcare consumer. And I understand why this trend is occurring. And it's because we want to empower people to make better decisions. I get that, and I'm all for empowerment. The issue, though, with changing vocabulary is that if we start thinking of healthcare as a commodity and not a right, it becomes much easier to deny people access to life-saving treatment. And it also becomes a lot easier for doctors to charge a lot more and to order unnecessary testing because medicine becomes then much more of a business. So I, I would suggest not changing this language. And the third thing is to make sure that patients are involved in every decision. Um, David Feinberg, who is a, a, a psychiatrist and uh, is the CEO at UCLA, likes to start his talks with asking people who are, um, who are healthcare administrators to raise their hands to say, who of you are not just an administrator, but actually a patient? And of course, everybody will, will raise their hands and say, well, I'm a patient as well. But then he'll say, well, how many of you are not administrators and how many of you are patients? And generally, these rooms of people who, are, who want to do healthcare reform, nobody raises their hand. And I would say if patients are not involved in deciding what research is done, if they're not involved in deciding how we're going to shape our healthcare system, then we're not really doing reform at all. So, you know, what I'm saying is controversial in part because it sounds like I'm anti-science, but I'm not. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have science or that we shouldn't make policy changes, but rather that while all of these things are happening, there's something each of us can do. And so I just want to end with the follow-up to these three cases and let you know why I chose them. So Jerry the mechanic and Danielle the college student, they were actually both patients of mine. I'm the guilty doctor, the doctor who ordered unnecessary tests, who didn't listen and who forced my patient out the window. And I talk about this because, you know, I didn't mean to do it, right? I mean, I certainly, <laughs> I didn't go into medicine wanting to practice checklist medicine. And I know, and I've trained with so many great people over the years, and I know that they also do not go into medicine because we want to be bad doctors. And with very few exceptions, we're all very well intentioned, I think, doctors and other health, um, and, uh, and nurses and other health professionals. The issue, though, is that there are so many pressures and there's so many adverse incentives, and we need our patients' help to become better doctors. As for Sandy, the school teacher, well, I tell the story because she was my mother. I was a second year medical student when she was diagnosed with metastatic cancer. And I will always remember her calling me to tell me that she was having these symptoms that she couldn't explain and that her doctor couldn't explain. I would go with her to her doctor's appointment when I came back from, from, from medical school. And you know what? She would ask me to not raise her concerns with her doctor because she was so afraid. She was afraid that if she spoke up or if I spoke up that somehow she would be the bad patient 
and that her doctor would react negatively and maybe fire her as a patient. Don't think that I don't reflect on this every day and wonder what if. How would things have been different? Would things have been different if I did speak up? And so if there's any doubt that one person can make a difference, then please let that be my lesson. My mother was still alive when I started writing my book, When Doctors Don't Listen. She was a very private person and initially pretty hesitant about having her story be told. But then she said to me that she wanted me to share the lessons that we learned. That speaking up is really important as empowered patients, not empowered consumers. That doing what's right can often be hard, but that's something that all of us as healthcare professionals and as patients really must do. And that ultimately medicine is about medical care and transforming the future of medicine has to start with each of us. Thank you. Well, that was terrific. And just to be clear, we didn't cook this up because she's, <laughs> she's laid the platform for me to talk about what I'm going to talk about. It's not Lana. Thank you very much. They're terrific e examples of the problems. I, I thought before I talked about the future of medicine, though, it might be worth um, just going a bit over the past because I think it's quite easy to start with a rather gloomy view about where medicine is today and indeed perhaps where it may be going. But it is easy to forget in the last 60 years that we've had some huge advances in medicine. Vaccines have been a terrific public health advance. Penicillins, cephalosporins, and the other antibiotics, of course, invented here just across the street. Um, uh, major advances in medical practice. New advances in surgery have clearly had a big impact. And of course, in cardiovascular disease, in this country at least, in the last 15 years, we've reduced the age-specific mortality by 50%. So, you know, that is a, these are really big outputs. But I think, um, just to pick up where Liana was, that, that there are clearly issues. And I think most would agree that the system of healthcare and medicine isn't actually working as well as it should be. And you, everywhere you turn around, there are issues. Pharmaceutical industry, I think, by wide agreement is in serious trouble. The flow of new drugs has pretty much stopped. The biotech sector has also largely collapsed. Healthcare systems everywhere on the planet are short of money. They're contracting what they do. Um, and they are having a very difficult time applying the resource that they have to patients in a sensible and effective way. And I think what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about what some of the underpinning factors of that are and how this might move on in the next 15 or 20 years if, if we're lucky. Uh, and, and in many ways, the inefficiency of modern medicine is, has been in part driven by external factors. And of course, one of the most important ones is demographic change. And we're all well aware of the um, success in uh, society having many more people enjoying life in their 70s, 80s, and indeed in their 90s. In Japan, 6% of the population are nonagenarians. That's a very big number. And we'll be in the same position over the next 15 years. Um, now, it would be really nice if the medical profession could claim credit for that, which they usually do. But if you look at the plot of improved life expectancy from the mid-19th century, when, to be clear, there wasn't much going on in medicine, um, it's a straight line. And it's a straight line that progresses steadily from what was the average life expectancy for women in 1950 of about 48, now to a life average life expectancy of women of about 81. And it's an absolute, you take every data point you can find and it sits right on the line. And it continues to go up. So I think one of the conclusions of that is, despite all the stuff that medicine's been doing, that line was definitely on that trajectory before medicine was engaged, so it would be hard to argue that it's made a huge impact on the direction of that line. Um, and, it, and so there's probably something much more fundamental going on there, but this demographic shift is going to be extremely important for healthcare in the future because, of course, it's the elderly population that suffer from the major chronic diseases 
comorbidities and so on that's produced such a huge burden on healthcare systems. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about the underpinning biology of aging. It's an extremely interesting topic. I don't really have time to talk about it now, but of course, one of the one of the hypotheses that emerged is that um, one of the ways to increase your longevity is to stop eating, largely stop eating. So that works in the fly, it works in the nematode, it works in mice, works in rats, works in rabbits. And in fact, it also works in non-human primates. And there's some quite good epidemiological data uh, from periods where there's been starvation of populations. And it's very clear that they get um, in increased life expectancy. So. But before you all rush off, first of all, after the last couple of days, you're all in trouble, so I know that. <laughs> Secondly, before you all rush off and implement one of these fancy diets, the, I know the guy very well who ran the non-human primate study in Wisconsin, and I was chatting to him after he got the data, because of course he's very excited, got a big paper in science, all that stuff. And I said, well, you know, wh wh what's the major learning from this? And he said, well, it is true, you know, the monkeys who didn't eat, they lived a lot longer. No doubt about it, so it's probably true. But let me tell you, they were incredibly grumpy monkeys. <laughs> so, so anyway, we won't. I, I think we won't get to the bottom of that. But there is a demographic issue that underpins uh, a lot of this. So, so, one, what can one expect as our population steadily ages? Uh, and that is, we'll expect quite a lot of the chronic diseases that you see um, of aging chronic obstructive airways disease, diabetes, vascular disease, cancer, and so on. And that, of course, is a burden which is occurring often uh, with many of those diseases in individuals as they age. And I don't know what the emergency room looks like at George Washington, but I can tell you if you go up here, the average age of people in the emergency room is about 75 to 80 years of age. And that's, what's, that's really cru one of the things that's crushing the healthcare system. But, but that's not the only problem. And I think we're all aware that, that the inefficiencies that Leanna described in the system are really evident. Uh, drugs, the truth is, the drugs don't work. They work in about 30% of people well. They work a tiny bit in another 30% of people. They don't work at all in the other 30% of people. And 10% of people get some ghastly side effects. So you know that's basically a synopsis of the pharmaceutical industry. Um, <laughs> The, um, it, 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 it's also very clear that the healthcare systems don't know how to apply their resources. So, you know, we have these hugely funded, in most Western societies, the biggest consumer of cash from the taxpayer, this is not in America, actually it is in America, uh, uh, is the healthcare system. And yet, we're not able to make decisions about who really needs the resource, who doesn't need the resources. In an aging population, everybody's got a couple of diseases, but how do you apply that resource to treat the people who really need it and not spend a lot of money managing people who are in chronic, uh, who are in the chronic phase of their diseases. Um, and, and, and we're also, I think, gr deeply uh, disabled by the fact that we built a healthcare system 30 years ago, both here throughout Western Europe and in America, and the Chinese, incidentally, making exactly the same mistake. And that was a healthcare system to deal with acute exacerbations of disease. It was all based around the emergency room. And we dressed everybody up in pajamas. We gave them crash carts to run around with, <laughs> zapped around. It was a really exciting place to train. You know, as young doctors, it was very accelerating. But the truth is, it's got nothing to do with the burden of disease in the modern world. So we have all these big, fancy hospitals where, which are sucking up most of, the, most of the resource. And yet the burden of disease, which is largely in people living in the community, is not re really properly supported. And we're not putting much money into the aspects of disease that relate to early diagnosis, prevention, characterization of populations that'll have exacerbations to get to them earlier. So, so the, the system is really fundamentally flawed. But the problem that I want to talk about, which overlies a lot of that, and which I'll just spend five minutes on, is a problem that goes back to our old friend William Osler, who of course was here as the Regis Professor at the turn of the last century, and who was undoubtedly the man who defined medicine of the 20th century. And he did it by creating a diagnostic framework, a taxonomy of disease, as it were, which everybody has used for 100 years. And to be honest, it, for his day, it was absolutely terrific, because he categorized diseases in a way that we could kind of get our arms around, we could manage them, we could, we could get some prediction of nat natural history, and we knew roughly how to treat them. The, the problem was, of course, that he didn't have any tools to work out that taxonomy 
at the level of the mechanisms of the diseases that we're treating. So his was a purely descriptive definition of disease. Diabetes was very simply the presence of sugar in the urine. Interestingly, the same definition that the WHO uses now. But we now know, of course, that there are a million ways to get too much sugar in the urine. And they all have different mechanisms. They probably, many of them have very different therapies. They have different natural histories. A and so we've lumped people into these very broad categories of disease, which means that getting medicine to work well is almost impossible. Because if you develop a, a new drug for diabetes, you know for sure it'll only work in a subset of the diabetic population because it's a crudely defined um, uh, diagnostic framework. So it, it, it is, I, I always say that taxonomy is not the medical profession's finest hour because we have about six different systems, five or six different systems. First of all, we can do it on symptoms. So we heard the chest pain story, great story. You know, there, there are diseases where we make the symptoms a little bit fancier. Fibromyalgia means pain in the, in the fibrous tissue. You know, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a term that we apply to people. Has no mechanistic understanding. People, people like it because doctors can write it in the notes. Um, uh, so there's a sort of symptom-based, there's a disease called irritable bowel syndrome. It means you get pain in the belly. Who knows what that means in terms of mechanisms. So, you know, it's just, these are really, really very sloppy classifications. We use physiological variables to define disease. So everybody's got a blood sugar. It's just we arbitrarily cut, cut off the top end and the guys to the right have a disease and the guys to the left don't. So that doesn't make much sense. Same with blood, uh, hypertension. Though we still have eponymous terms for Alzheimer's disease, very good example. So in Alzheimer's, you go back and read Alzheimer's original paper, uh, which he wrote in the mid-19th century. Um, he described six patients with Alzheimer's disease. Four of the six um, did not have Alzheimer's disease. So <laughs> that small problem. No one reads the original literature. Um, uh, and then we've got an, orga we've got an organ-based system. This is a surgical, I'm sorry, there are probably surgeons there, I apologize for this, but there is a surgical system which is which bit of the body do you take off or take out? <laughs> and, and it's applied very widely in cancer, so we have colorectal cancer, we've got ovarian cancer, we've got prostate cancer. The truth is, of course, what we now know is that the cancers in each one of those organs are, are very often very different from each other from a mechanistic perspective, and some of the some breast cancers are more similar to some ovarian cancers than they are to other breast cancers. So, but, but you know, do we use that? And of course we don't. We still call it breast cancer. And, it, and of course it comes with all the associated um, uh, inaccuracy of natural history prediction, selection of therapies, and so on. And then my favorite diagnostic system is what I call the end of the road classification system, which is you take the organ which isn't doing so well and you bang the word failure after it and so you have heart failure, you, you, you have premature ovarian failure, you have all the failures and that basically it's a crude description of, of disease which doesn't, under, isn't, doesn't underpin anything that relates to uh, pathogenesis or mechanism. When I was a medical student they used to teach us, I don't believe it to the otherwise, I wasn't a very good medical student, but the, when I was here one of our psychiatric tutors said, there's only one really effective treatment for schizophrenia. Put them on a plane, send them to New York, and, the, and the, of course the definition of schizophrenia is different in New York. By the time they arrive, they'll be cured completely. <laughs> so it's kind of no wonder that the system doesn't work very well, because it's based on this platform where we don't have a taxonomy that reflects anything that's actually going on. So, so the good news is that that's kind of ch changing. And I think there are a variety of things that are driving that change. And one is the ability to analyze some of the pathways and mechanisms of disease. And I think that probably the most dramatic change in this space has been genetics, which you've al almost certainly heard lots about. But there was a very interesting transition point in that arena, which uh, uh, actually began in many ways here in Oxford, led by Peter Donnelly, who's in the audience, who wrote Scholar. And that was the ability to apply large-scale genetics at scale across large populations of people with disease and without. And this was the, the so-called Welcome Case Control Consortium, which was the first that really broke open the notion that you could find multiple genetic variants that were absolutely, with absolute certainty, associated and responsible in a causal way with disease. Uh, and that there were probably many thousands of those that most of the ones that were discovered were completely novel 
and indicated that in fact we probably, despite 100 years of research, knew precious little about any of the diseases that we were studying developing drugs for and trying to th treat. So that was, that was a really important observation. And that of course has progressed at, spe at speed because we, not, we are well aware that, that the two main etiological mechanisms for disease are first of all the environment, which is probably the most important factor in most diseases. And that's underpinned with a set of genetic determinants, which is also important, but probably less important, but more tractable in terms of discovery. And we're beginning to understand that dynamic because genetics is starting to subdivide diseases mechanistically that we can then study environment in. And there's some really spectacular examples about how we can better understand environment in the context of uh, the genetics. The pace of change in genetics uh, is being driven these days by a technological revolution which is probably the most impressive that science has ever seen, and that is the ability to sequence genomes. Th that technology has evolved in a variety of places, but the three major types of technology used to sequence genomes were all invented in the UK, interestingly, and exploited, two of them exploited in the US, but invented here. And they're allowing us now to sequence genomes at a great pace. The first human genome was sequenced between 2001 and, and uh, sorry, between 1991 and 2002, roughly. They announced it in 2002. In fact, Bill Clinton announced it. Um, but um, the, and that cost about a billion dollars and took about 10 years to do. So that was the pace at which you could sequence. Current methodology, you can sequence the same genome for about a thousand dollars and you can do it in a few hours. And the next generation technology uh, will be able to do it for a hundred dollars and do it in a few minutes. So, th and, th and that will be available certainly within the next five years. So the pace of change is quite dramatic uh, in, that, in that arena. And that's going to drive many, many more of these exciting uh, and important insights into, into human disease. And will, I think, uh, provide us with a framework on which to build a taxonomy. But I just want to make one more comment, which is, is that there, there is a, there's a sort of view that genetics does everything. And I think genetics is an important part of the story, but it's the relationship of genetics to the, to the features of the people with disease. This gets back to the point that you've got to really understand what the patient's suffering from and relate those phenotypes to the disease process and the genetics. And it's the combination of the two that I think is really powerful. As you may have heard, the UK is amongst the first to roll out genetics, whole genome sequencing in a clinical setting. We're doing 100,000 genomes in the next few years um, uh, in patient populations. Uh, but there are also other large sets of data that you can use to think about the underpinning etiological factors of disease to try and create this new taxonomy. Define the 30 or 40 subtypes of diabetes. Define the different types of Alzheimer's disease. And on the back of that, develop much more effective therapies. We've got a very exciting project led out of Oxford again, which is the Biobank project in the UK, where half a million people have undergone very detailed characterization, physiological characterization, questionnaires, um, and an extensive um, set of um, measurements, including bone marrow density and blood pressures, ECGs, all that stuff. And they've given blood and urine for analysis. And they're being tracked as a cohort of 500,000 people by Rory Collins and his colleagues linked into medical records so that we can know what they suffer from, what they die of. And that's a hugely powerful experiment because it'll allow us to do the genetics and the genomics in that population, which is being done in collaboration with Peter and others at the moment, and line them up with what they're suffering from. And that should give us real insights into what's, uh, what's going on. Uh, associated with that, there's a very large imaging project going on. So there's, they're doing 100,000 MRI images of brain, heart, and whole body MRI images in that cohort. And they will be a set of digitized records available for um, analysis to try and use that phenotype to correlate with other types of, of information, including genetic information. And of course, we have in the UK the, the electronic patient record, which was, a, which was a bit of an embarrassment because the well, they ran the program, as you know, everybody knows the story, it was a complete disaster. They spent about uh, 10 billion pounds on it before they realized the guy running it was a bit of a nut. And um, uh, so they, anyway, they had to shut it down and start all over again. But that's now beginning to really get traction. And, and I think the ability 
to have access to digitized records of patients is a hugely important piece of this story. Uh, and it's much more possible in a single payer healthcare system uh, as we have here than it is in a private system. So when you add all that data together and you then have different types of data, you can actually start to make some really powerful observation of what's going on. And I'll give you just a few examples from our own shop here that show you what's happened. There's a chap here who's been building these large cohorts amongst patients with stroke. Peter Rothwell is his name. And he's been able to recognize that there are a whole set of really key features of people who are having small neurological events, which are highly predictive of having big neurological events. And identifying them and treating them aggressively and appropriately prevents now, we believe, about 10,000 major strokes in the UK a year and saves the NHS 200 million pounds a year. So this is preventative medicine, but, but using the patient history and story, as well as genetics, to try and identify patient populations. Um, uh, there, uh, there are very interesting stories about how one can develop new predictive tools, new predictive tools for colorectal cancer that work much better than most of the screening tests. They're, they've been evolved and look extremely interesting. And we've got a great story about malaria, and I'll finish on this story because I think it's a terrific example of how you can bring these different sets of modern data together. As you know, we've got a major global health program here. It's been a, a defining feature of Oxford Medicine since David Weatherall set it up 30 years ago. We've got multiple units in the developing world. We're the major surveillance system for Western Europe for most of the emerging infections. And we, we run malaria surveillance globally and have done for many years. And our scientists in Asia made a very interesting observation 10 years ago, and that is when you get resistant um, plasmodium false palm, which is the bad malaria, it always first occurs in a very small bit of Western Cambodia. And uh, they're forever culturing parasites, so they know, know what's resistance. And the, the lab's got seeing lots and lots of samples. And they made this observation that was clearly the case with the original chloroquine resistance, with methylchine resistance, more recently with artemisinin resistance. Every malaria drug that's been used, which ultimately falls to malaria resistance, has emerged in the same region of the globe. So everyone says, well, what's that mean? And so, you know, people say, well, counterfeit medicines, blah, 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 you know, lots of people with, with ideas but no data. Um, so uh, we set about trying to study that, and Dominic Kiotowski is very powerful in this space, and we've collected thousands and thousands of malaria samples, which we apply genetics to, so we sequence them. It can be done very easily, straight from the blood sample. And we started to map the whole set of malaria subspecies around the globe. And it's a very complex map. But over here, there's a tiny subset of malaria which looks completely different than all the other malarias. And guess where it comes from? Two villages in western Cambodia. Now, there's an interesting question about why it's such an isolate and it hasn't spread in its own right. And, and the answer is that those villages are surrounded with landmines from the war. So there's not a lot of mobility, either in or out. So, <laughs> so, um, so, so some of these, you know, the, 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 there's sometimes interesting reasons why this happens. But the, mo the, the punchline here is having defined it, when you look at the genetics of the parasite, it's got a whacking big mutation in the mutator locus, which makes it a highly mutable form of malaria. So you expose it to a drug it mutates really, really quickly, and bingo, guess what you got? The next resistant form of malaria. Sub bits of that get out, they get to Africa, they get to South America. So the punchline, and Trevor Mundell, another Rhodes Scholar who runs the Gates Foundation, who I help with a variety of things, uh, said to me when I last met him, he said, the entire world of malaria eradication has now changed. Because if you eradicate that substrain in Western Cambodia, you will fix the problem. So large data sets, genetics, better definition of disease, it's probably the way this field has to develop. A and I, I would just support Liana in saying, if we keep going down the road we're currently going, I think it's almost certain to fall off a cliff. So, so there we are. Thank you very much. I think we're, we're happy to take some questions if anybody's got any questions or comments or things they wanted to raise. Mike. Yeah, just a quick, yeah, is there any 
is there any data to show that uh, salary doctors uh, test less uh, inappropriately than financial incentive doctors? So in the U.S., we do have some examples of this. So Mayo, Cle uh, Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, that there are large, um, or there are large systems where there are salary doctors, and that in fact is the case. And so we do know that um, that financial incentives play a role, which I think is actually pretty interesting because you know when you ask doctors, and doctors, I, I'm a doctor, where there are many of, of, of us here, so I'm saying this about all of us really that. Um, when you ask doctors about whether they're influenced by drug companies or whether they're influenced by money, I mean, I don't think anybody is trying to say, well, if I do this one more test, then I'm paying my, my, my kids' college tuition. I mean, it's not that blatant, right? But when you ask them, are you influenced by drug companies? The answer is no. If you ask them, though, are your colleagues influenced by drug companies, they'll say yes. <laughs> and so it's the you but not me phenomenon. And I think you see this in over-testing as you do in treatment. Yes, here and then. With the, uh, the genome sequencing and all the an analysis of the data, probably you were hinting towards personali personalized medicine for different sets of people who walk in. You also said in the beginning the pharma industry is struggling to bring any new drugs. So one would wonder the, uh, in the basket the number of drugs will not increase very much, but your association would indicate that different people have to be treated with different drugs. We see this problem very much in tuberculosis right now. We see a huge problem where there are no drugs. So how do we handle this? On one side, you have huge amount of data indicating you several different stuff, but you haven't got drugs to tell people how to cure them. Yeah, so I, so I, I think the point's a really good one because people... Can you repeat the question, uh, so so the, the question was, if genetics and the likes is going to push us to increasingly personalized medicine, how do you square the issue that you're going to lead, need multi, a very large number of drugs to treat these specific mechanistic en entities uh, and yet still keep the cost down and make it a reasonable health economic um, uh, paradigm? So, so, so the answer to that is that I, I think the, the difference is that the drugs that we produce in the new arena will work, unlike the current situation where the drugs we produce on the whole don't work. So, so there is a difference if you get really good efficacy, even in a small population, you can actually have quite a profound effect, where if you get sort of just a bit better than placebo efficacy, which of course is the, is the definition for registration by the regulators, then, then you're going you're to have a hugely inefficient system. I think the real question is whether pharmaceutical industry can get away from its addiction to the old model, which is let's try and sell as many drugs through GPs as to as many people as we can to a much more focused and targeted methodology. Some, I, and I think it'll be interesting because there will be winners and losers. There will be some companies who can do it and others who don't. But, but I'm, I'm not actually worried about the economics because you should be able to dramatically change the, the development paradigm as well. If you've, got a drug, if you've got a drug that really works really well for a major unmet need, you may not need thousands of patients to prove that it works. And and I think with these new models of adaptive licensing where if you can prove really good efficacy, you can demonstrate the safety in real life after the thing's been marketed if you have electronic records to do it. So I'm not, I'm not so worried about that. I think the real question is how long will it take for people to get it? Down at the end. I'm not sure I can be articulate about this, but you are, it was fascinating the way the two linked. And it's not surprising <clears throat> if you're in a world where the taxonomies aren't so great, the basic mechanisms aren't so well understood, and you have an absence of large data sets, that then the frontline physicians tend to, to wind up trying to grok, to use a Robert Heinlein term, uh, what in fact is, is going on. And so the question is really of Dr. Wen, is, is anything happening sort of to the technology of stories? To how do you, how do you link what you ask and what you elicit from a patient is anything? Is there? A, is that developing in relationship to the kinds of trends that Dr. Bell was talking about? 
So that's a great question. And, um, and, uh, and, and for those of you who didn't hear, I, I'm not sure that I can paraphrase it quite as articulately as, as you put it, but it's about the technology of stories, right? I mean, we talk about technology of genomics and technology of pharmaceuticals, and there's so much research in it, in part because there is a lot of money in it as well, right? I mean, that's, those are things that we could market, and that could bring in money to drug companies, and so there are people who want to fund it. But far fewer people can do research on technology of stories because that's not really what sells. And actually, I would argue that if you could, if you get better storytelling, you're going to need fewer tests. And that's not exactly going to help those who have money either. And so there's not as much research into this. And actually, all the research into it tends to be the opposite. It tends to be, can we get a computer program to replace the doctor? Right? If we just get a list of, of, of questions, maybe you can program everything in and find out that you know, you're a man with abdominal pain and pregnancy is one of the things that you could possibly have. I mean, I don't know. You, know, you, you go through, you, you, uh, you Google your, your, uh, your, your symptoms. That's an example of something that, that's, that's been developing. So I would, I mean, to your point, that's something that really needs to be done. Um, and especially as we're talking about personalized care and personalizing care to your genome, how about personalizing care at least to your story and you as a patient to start with? John. Uh, that, I'm spending a lot of time now in educating med students, as you know, and I think that's, you've hit upon the fundamental paradox now. When John and his colleagues can in for $100 in five minutes tell a patient his or her genome and then tell the insurance companies that they're uninsurable. <laughs> um, the value of spending 30 to 45 minutes, I'm a neurologist, taking a history in a way that I learned in a very inefficient, uh, ostensibly very efficient way at the foot of other masters <coughs> is going to be even less attractive to many people. The students, they, they don't read textbooks, they just Google. And they don't want to spend the time. And the healthcare payers, funders, I think whether private or public, are not interested in that. We're getting bigger medical schools, more medical schools. So we've totally lost the art of history taking. And I don't think it can be, in theory, it's, you can make it an algorithm. But I don't actually know if we can, because there's too much fuzzy logic in there. How are we going to do that? How are we going to value? and keep valuing the art of history taking and then a few test selections uh, and, and prove to the funders we actually save thousands of dollars that way. So, so I think one of the problems is that the, uh, there, what you're, and what you're alluding to, is that the quality of the history and the value of the history to some extent is dependent on the practitioner and the experience of the practitioner. So when a house officer takes a history, it's usually not very helpful. And for those of you who've been in attending and you go around on ward rounds, the house officer goes blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, get on to the next patient. Um, so, 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 there, uh, so it is actually something which is, which is crucially important, so I agree with all that. But it actually, you, you develop, because it is fuzzy, you, it's basically large, largely based on your experience. I've seen somebody with this kind of chest pain before. I better be really careful because last time they had an aortic aneurysm, not a coronary, and I better look at this and that. And, that. and you know, it's that experience which is really important. I would say that we're largely losing that in medical schools anyway because no one's got the time to do it. And it's, it's, a, it's a real problem because you won't, despite all the high tech bits, you will not be able, I think, in, in our lifetimes or even Liana's lifetime to practice medicine without good history taking, I think. If I can add one thing too about medical training to your point, so I have this exercise that I do with medical students and residents that's called No Questions Asked. And I ask them to see a patient and literally ask no questions. I mean, you can ask clarifying questions like, who is this in the room with you? Or, yeah, I don't know, I mean, how old are you? Or, I mean, you have to ask some questions, but really try to get the history without any questions at all. And when they're first year medical students, they have no idea how to take a history and they say, well, I, I can't do this. But I say, you know, just try and see. And I do the same thing with third year medical students and interns. And actually, the best histories come from first year medical students because they really don't ask questions and they really just listen. They don't know what questions to ask. And when they're third year medical students, they begin asking all these, you know, when did your pain start? Where does it radiate to? And I think they get less. And when they're interns or residents, they refuse because they say, I don't have time. And so one of the things that I'm working on now is I'm doing a time motion study, in fact, to show that listening for those extra 30 to 40 seconds even, 
rather than the eight to 10 seconds, will give you more history, will avoid these tests, which then you have to follow up on, right? I mean, if you order a CT scan or a chest x-ray, you have to read the x-ray, you see this little spot, what do you do with this? You write it in the chart, you talk to the patient, you talk to the primary care doctor. I mean, that actually, uh, my hypothesis is, it actually takes more time. And so to bring this back to what can we do about it, I think that patients have to do something too. I mean, certainly doctors have to change and our medical system, our medical school training has to change. But if patients start demanding time, start demanding that you tell your story, we know from studies too that what you as the individual patient do does make a big difference because what you do will influence your doctor with subsequent patients. And I think that's pretty powerful to say that change could happen starting from the grassroots level. I, I think there's another just to just to add to this, because it's quite an important issue, there's another piece to the change in healthcare. So, the, you know, the role of the doctor has got to be uh, um, all pervasive across healthcare. So, you know, people say, oh, well, the doctor better look at the results, the doctor may, may, better make a decision. And, and what we're doing in the UK at the moment is we're trying to get away from doctors because they're all on a contract which is too expensive anyway. So, this, this gets to the public orator's point he made last, yesterday. Um, about reimbursement. A and many of the patients who we're trying to look after are in chronic phase. And one of the interesting questions is what percentage of those patients and their carers can manage data in a way that they take ownership of what's going on? So we've gone from a very paternalistic system where everybody said, well, actually, the doctor's got your notes, he knows what's going on, he'll read the test, blah, 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 to a situation where patients are becoming increasingly informed. They want to know the data themselves. They often keep the data, they monitor the data, and you can monitor, you can maintain rather large populations of people if you provide them with the tools to maintain and control and monitor their disease much more effectively than you can with repeated docking to physicians. And I think the criticism of so-called digitized medicine where the, it's basically the doctors at the end of the thing looking at all this data coming in from unknown patients is absolutely valid. Where, where that criticism is not valid is where patients use digitized tools to maintain and monitor their own disease. And there, the evidence that patients do much better is very persuasive. The, the model in Scotland in diabetics reduced amputations by 40% and blindness by 32% or something. So, so the ability for people to be involved in their disease, I think, is really important. And of course, that's the biggest workforce you can get. And it's a really cheap workforce because you don't have to pay them. So. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> both of you have talked about us both of you have talked about a system that is very doctor centric now couldn't we get better teamwork where you have nurses who could spend the time listening who are strong enough or empowered enough to, 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 to take on a doctor who doesn't listen you know if we don't develop teams it's not just a matter of a doctor and a patient there's a whole set of other people who provide health care and if you're in a hospital frankly I'd get better care from the nurse than I've ever gotten from a doctor who hasn't seemed disinterested in me as a patient. So how do we start developing teamwork in a better way? So I can start answering this and say that you're absolutely right. I mean, medicine is very hierarchical. I mean, having gone through training in very hierarchical systems, I went to Mass General for residency. You know, it's still very, um, still uh, very much of, well, you're the intern. You don't say anything. We, we wore, as interns, we wore short white coats. You know, it's still that kind of, um, of, 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 of system. And we know that um, patient safety isn't helped by this, right? When nurses don't speak up, when people in so-called not, not positions of power aren't empowered to speak up, then nobody gets Gets good, uh, nobody gets good medical care. So I think that's something that has to happen. Safety culture or patient or, or that kind of culture has to change. But also patients have to be empowered to speak up as well. And I think that's something that we have to bring together, right? That it's about, as you said very well, that it's about teamwork. It's about making sure that everyone is able to speak up if they see a problem. Um, but also task shifting is something that we have to work on. I think um, Sir John talked about this very well, that we also have to decide, you know, is it, it, maybe the doctor doesn't have to be the one sorting through all this data. Maybe it's the nurse practitioner who can coordinate things in the, um, in, you know, in, in the US, it's definitely true that nurses tend to be the best listeners, and also that um, patients feel the most comfortable even when they're communicating with the nurse or the physician assistant and letting them kind of hear and experience first, um, first of all what the, what the patient is going through. So I definitely agree that that needs to be done. Yes. Do you sometimes not worry that the technology seems to be driving the question that you will ask in the lab, whether it's proteomics or genomics or 
huge ability to do sequencing. I sometimes really wonder <coughs> if we are placing far too, if we're driven by the technology right now, kind of questions that we can ask. Well, I mean, Does I, it worry I, you? I, I mean, obviously it's technology driven, but the, the I mean, there, there needs to be some significant innovation in the healthcare space for us to make the numbers add up, because the numbers don't add up. And, and there are two drivers of innovation. There's technology-based innovation, which I think will have a fundamental part, and there's a systems-based innovation. And you need both. So, so we do have to fundamentally change the way we think about how you manage integrated care so you keep people out of hospitals, manage them better in another setting. Who do you need to do that? How do you do that? But just to take your, your mycobacterial example, so you know we're in a mess with tuberculosis. It's very difficult to track uh, contacts. The public health stuff is hopeless. It takes ages to culture the pathogens, so you don't know for a long time whether it's resistant or not. Um, I, there are increasing resistant strains, which we can't really get our arms around. The, the, the UK has just introduced a system where all mycobacterial uh, species, all mycobacterial cultures will be sequenced. Gets you two months earlier in the process getting an answer. The sequence tells you from the beginning whether they're resistant and to what drugs. And for contract tracing, because it's a very slowly mutating pathogen, you can track exactly who got what pa pathogen from whom. So you don't have to go around asking who coughed on you last week. So the, it's, I mean, it, th those sort of innovations are really transformative, and they save money. So that, that's a key piece of this. Dr. Gotto. We're being told that we have, uh, maybe this will be our last question. Dr. Gotto was trying to get in. Okay. <laughs> Microphone over here. Yep. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Here. I two more questions. Yeah. No. No. Go on. Go on. Go on. My question is really around the economic um, paradox uh, between diagnosis and, and therapeutics. We really live in a drug-centric world from an economic perspective, and uh, that's not to blame the pharmaceutical industry, but maybe to compliment them for having done such a great job influencing reimbursement agencies about reimbursing their drugs for the value of the innovation that went into developing the drug, not simply the cost of dispensing that drug. You take the diagnostics industry and everything you've said about the misdiagnosis being one of the biggest problems, 80% of decisions made in the healthcare system are made as a result of a diagnostic, but about less than 10% of the expenses go into that those diagnostics. So there is no economic incentive in the private sector to develop a better diagnostic. So there, if there was ever a public good argument for making a, uh, an, a, 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 a concerted effort to do appropriate translational medicine that not only takes into account pouring money into technology development, but then testing it on very relevant clinical cohorts of patients engaging the pharmaceutical industry, engaging the diagnostics industry, and engaging academia in doing this. I've been in the biotech industry for over 20 years, and I have not seen even one iota of attention being given to this compared to what is poured into development of novel drugs and novel targets, even in academia. TB is a great example. The Gates Foundation gives probably a whole lot more of its money to therapeutic development than to potentially uh, dispensing proper diagnosis and, 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 uh, and discovering those. So, so that, the, the point, point is absolutely, absolutely well, well taken. And I think there is an opportunity to change that paradigm as diseases get increasingly stratified and diagnostics become increasingly important to define who you do. And in the UK, as you know, we've got a thing called NICE, which makes decisions about the value you bring to the table with your innovation. And it seems to me, and this has been argued, although not yet sufficiently persuasively to happen, that if you bring a diagnostic that th says you don't have to treat this half the patients with the drug because it's the other half that do better, then you save the healthcare system X amount of money. That should be converted into qualities and be placed on the value of the diagnostic. So that, those arguments are going on. The Academy produced a report about three months ago which said exactly that. Hasn't happened yet, but it's going to be crucial for the future. I don't want to let drug companies off the hook, though, um, with, the, with, with, uh, with your question, because diagnosis and treatment are very much linked. And drug companies have done a very good job of linking them back to each other, such that we have an, a, a big issue of overdiagnosis. So GlaxoSmithKline, and I believe in naming and shaming as well. So GlaxoSmithKline, uh, Requip, which was a drug used for Parkinson's, was going off patent. So what did they do? They said, 
we want to find a new use for Requip. What about this new this syndrome that nobody's really heard of called restless leg syndrome? Let's let's make it let's not make it about requip. Let's make it about telling people about this syndrome. And so things that define restless leg syndrome are: if you've been sitting down for a long time, do you feel like you have to move your legs? If you've been if you've been I'm paraphrasing, but this is basically if you've been lying down for a long time, sometimes do your legs get numb and you feel better after you move them? I mean, everybody says yes to this, and bingo, they found a new way to market their medication, they found a new way to market their treatment, and now there's a new diagnosis too. So I'm just saying that, yes, you're right, that diagnosis, we don't spend the money perhaps in diagnosis. However, with, by, uh, with drug companies redefining mental illness, now everybody needs antidepressants. And now everybody, now there are new diseases all the time. We have pre-hypertension. What is pre-hypertension? I mean, aren't we all, don't we have all pre-hypertension? Don't we all have pre-diabetes or pre-death? I mean, you know, what, what is this really about? And so, um, and so I just think that, you know, we need to be, it, yes, it's true that we need to be more cognizant of diagnosis and treatment, but let's not forget what the drivers are, the economic drivers are. Um, but, uh, just one other important, while we're talking about the economics of this, the, the increasing tendency uh, is to think again how healthcare systems will pay for outcomes and results, not for products. So uh, on the whole, healthcare products have been sold, you buy it, you take your risk, it might not work, who cares, you gotta pay for it up front. Increasingly, healthcare systems are saying, actually, I think we'll pay on the back of outcomes. So if, we, if it works and the healthcare system saves a lot of money, we'll split the profits with you. And, and that's interesting, I think, where, uh, where this digital health thing is likely to go because the healthcare system will say, actually, if it works as well as you say it is, then we'll work out how much money it saves and we'll give you half and we'll keep half. So th I think there are different ways of using the economics to make it much more effective. Dr. Gotto. Well, the, the curriculum of medical education in the United States is currently undergoing significant revision. Some of these uh, changes may be self-evident, uh, but uh, uh, what it's moving toward is defining a set of competencies that a medical graduate will have, and a number of these are very closely related to what uh, the issues that you've appropriately discussed today, such as practicing cost-effective medicine, uh, taking a history that's both incisive as well as culturally sensitive, uh, and in addition to um, looking at the scientific basis of the medical student's uh, ability, also looking uh, at the empathetic and ethical aspect and trying to evaluate that. Uh, toward this end, the MCAT examination, uh, which is used uh, for uh, evaluating medical students applying to, to school, uh, starting in 2015, we'll have a series of questions uh, that attempt to evaluate uh, empathetic uh, aspects of the student. So I think any the, trying to change the healthcare system requires uh, looking at a lot of different moving parts, uh, but it certainly has to include the education of the future generation of doctors as an important part of it. Thank you. I think that's extremely well said, and I totally agree with you. Medical students are very good at checking off boxes, and it, uh, it reminds me actually I was giving a talk to medical students um, about you know about compassion and empathy, and you know and, and about misdiagnosis really. And somebody raised their hand and said, "Is this talk about empathy?" And yes, I mean it was about empathy, and and I said, "Well, sure. I mean I guess you know it's included." And um, and I mean isn't everything about empathy uh, in a way depending on whether you're a lump or a splitter, right? And so anyway, so so the medical student was like, "Oh, we well we." heard about this. We heard the lecture about empathy already, and, and, and if you don't mind, we have to go study for another exam. <laughs> and so all I'm saying is, you know, we are very good at these check boxes, and I, I totally agree that these things have to be included in the curriculum, but it's about how we do it. And also, can we select, as you were alluding to, the right students, right, who really have service and social obligation and responsibility to society, even when they enter, and then fostering that throughout their, their medical training as well. I think the, the whole, the multiple choice evaluation system, which is now completely pervaded North American medicine, is a complete disaster. Because if you want to communicate, you don't communicate with patients by 
doing a multiple choice. And it leads to really bad behavior. So somebody's going to have to rethink about that. But anyway, that's probably too much for today. But thanks, everybody, for coming. It's been